Hello and welcome to this uh, quick uh, video about the Ghost GLib Get Host by Name vulnerability, also known as CV 2015-0235. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I work for the SANS Technology Institute. If you have any questions, comments or such, you can reach me on the Internet Storm Center website at isc.sans.edu. First, a quick outline here. I want to cover a little bit of background of this vulnerability, then give you an idea of who is at risk, how do you mitigate the vulnerability, and if you get attacked, how do you know that you get attacked, and how urgently do you have to patch? In other words, are there any exploits available, and if not, how soon will there be exploits available? So a little bit background here, glibc is the GNU implementation of the C standard library. There are many libc's, for example, BSD has its own libc. Essentially any operating system that uses C supports the API that's defined in the standard library, but the Linux in particular tends to use the GNU implementation and that's the one we are really talking about here. Now, for other operating systems like Windows, for example, uh, BSDs and such, you do use different uh, libc's, but in many cases you can get copies of glibc, in particular if you're porting Linux software over to that operating system. Now, the get host by name function is part of that standard, but it's really part of an older version of that standard. However, it's so commonly used that it's still should be considered current. So you can't say that you if you have some software that was written uh, this year, last year, that it does not use get host by name. There is a, actually a pretty good chance that it still uses that function. This got, get host by name function is a part of this Berkeley sockets standard. So it's part of the standard network library or network function part of a libc. And its main feature is that it converts host names to IPv4 addresses. So if you want to connect to a particular host, you usually call get host by name to get that host's IPv4 address. And then you open a socket to that host. That way it's also used on client servers so pretty much most network software uses this function or it's your equivalent get address info the reason get address info is uh, preferred these days is that it has better ipv6 support actually get address info is somewhat agnostic as to what address family you're using if it's ipv4 ipv6 both will work and somewhat transparently uh, to this remainder of the software and how you open that socket now, what's this vulnerability about? Before converting a host name to an IP address, what a get host by name does is it checks if what you pass to it is already an IP address. Now, when it does that, the function does not calculate the size of the buffer correctly. It actually misses out uh, the size of a one pointer. So as a result, it does not reserve enough memory. And then you have relatively small actually buffer overflow. It's just the size of that pointer, which is either four bytes for 32-bit systems or eight bytes for 64-bit systems. Now, in order to trigger this vulnerability, the argument also has to sort of look like an IP address. It can only contain numbers and dots and uh, only up to three dots. Now, how many numbers you have, that's uh, really up to you. So uh, that's arbitrary and that's sort of where the buffer overflow comes in. And then the last four to eight bytes of uh, that uh, argument, they can then be used to execute code. Now, who is vulnerable here? Which versions of glibc are vulnerable? Turns out that actually this bug was fixed in glibc back in May 2013, but it wasn't recognized that this was a security bug. As a result, uh, operating systems that use older versions of glibc before 2.17 will not have backported that patch and are still vulnerable. And because glibc a lot of the Linux distributions support a little bit older versions, sort of be backwards compatible. There isn't really sort of any pressing need uh, to use the latest and greatest version. So even, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, which is very recent, or CentOS 7, the equivalent here, are warnable. 
Ubuntu 12 is vulnerable, 14, which is the latest uh, version of Ubuntu, the latest long-term support version, is not vulnerable. It does use uh, glibc 2.19. Now, as far as the BSD variants goes, they're typically not vulnerable, at least not vulnerable out of the box. But uh, then again, if you install, for example, on OS 10, some of the homebrew ports or such that allow you to port Linux software over uh, to OS 10, then you may have installed it and you may be vulnerable. So as far as software goes, pretty much any software that uses the network is potentially vulnerable because they at some point may take a host name and convert it to an IP address. And then the question really is, are they using get host by name or are they using get address info? Log processing may be vulnerable because you no know, log processing you sometimes convert host names to IP addresses. Mail spam filtering, for example, proc mail is vulnerable. So many servers, many clients are vulnerable, and as a result, because they are already connected to the network, it can be used to exploit this vulnerability also remotely. Now, how do you figure out uh, what version of uh, glibc or libc you have? You can actually just run the, the library as an executable, as I sort of have shown here, and it will return the version. It will also return the build date later on in this output. It's a pretty lengthy output that didn't fit here on the slide, so I uh, put the ellipses here uh, where I left out a part of it. In, on Linux, what you'll find is if you patched the system, it will not update the version number, but it will update the compiled on date. Like in this case, this was done with a current uh, CentOS system. It uses uh, the glibc version 2.12, but this version was built on January 27th, so yesterday as the patch was released. The only really mitigation you have is to patch, so that's really the important part. You have to patch quickly. Where do you find this library? Your CentOS, Ubuntu, uh, where you find it. OS 10 depends a little bit. You can just use the find command, for example, you know, to search for libc.so. Uh, just search for libc.so, not necessarily libc.so.6 or so. What you also may find is uh, that there you know, you'll find a couple of instances of this file name, but they tend to be sort of symlinks uh, to each other, to the actual location of uh, the glibc library. Now, how do you detect the attack? How do you know that you are being attacked? Essentially, what the attack requires is that your software resolves one of these oddly formed host names. And I sort of have a little sample here, but typically you should expect them to be a thousand plus digits. At least uh, these are uh, the sort of samples that Qualys used in its uh, sort of proof of concept exploits as part of its uh, advisory. So anything that has only numbers and dots and up to three dots is possible. For example, all zeros without any dots, that works too. And then that's sort of a common test string. That's so for example, Qualys has shown against the uh, XM and such, but you need a lot of digits. So what you're looking for is lookups for host names like that. The problem is if you're vulnerable, then uh, get host by name will likely crash and you will never see that lookup on the network. So what you're most likely going to see here is unsuccessful exploit attempts, not successful ones. So look for these DNS lookups, uh, A records. You may find them, for example, in your query logs of your recursive name server. I didn't see a snort signature yet for this, but it's possible that someone can come up uh, with a passable snort signature to look for uh, these host names that would come from the system under attack. It's not that the attacker sort of sends a DNS query in to your system. The host name itself would be embedded in some email or whatever. So it's really more difficult to detect this uh, sort of on the way into your network. But the name lookup that's then triggered, that's really what you're looking for. And it's coming from the system that's under attack. Like I mentioned, so uh, how likely is it that we'll see an exploit? The exploit appears to be tricky, you know, only eight bytes, best case on a 64-bit system. You can only use digits and dot. Well, uh, Qualys managed to come up with an exploit with a working exploit that executes arbitrary code on the mail server XM. They have not released this particular exploit yet. And as part of the advisory 
Qualis has shown sort of a proof of concept as a denial of service conditions against XM and a number of other servers. So the exploit is certainly possible, probably a little bit uh, tricky to implement. Qualis promised to help out the attackers here by soon releasing the XM exploit they came up with. Now, um, they haven't really defined what soon means here, at least I haven't seen that yet. Uh, maybe I missed that in their advisory, uh, but they did promise a Metasploit module. They also released a lot of detail about how to exploit this. So it's very possible that someone else will come up with exploits for certain software pretty soon here. I would guess that by the end of the week, we will have a public exploit out there that is sort of in wide distribution. Fusion. Wouldn't be surprised if uh, some uh, exploit developers already have an exploit today, but I haven't really seen anything sort of being uh, advertised or distributed at this point. So quick summary here. This is a very critical vulnerability. Lots of software is vulnerable. It does allow arbitrary code execution. The detection is a little bit tricky here. Like I said, there is no snort signature there yet. Also watch for, for example, software crashing. You know, that would be an indication that someone is trying to exploit you here. Uh, your main priority at this point should be just patch. Uh, by the end of this week, you probably need to have your server patched uh, to properly defend your network against attacks that are going to be developed for this vulnerability. Well, this is it uh, for now. Here again, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, uh, my email address, the email address of our Internet Storm Center handlers, and then also the URL for our contact form that uh, will help you, for example, to submit samples or anything like that uh, if you would like to do so. Thanks for uh, listening and, uh, well, uh, talk to you soon. I also do a daily podcast if you're interested in that, and I'll feature updates about this vulnerability in the next edition that I'll record tonight. Bye.